Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Supervisor Euler, uh, Euler, Holmes. I won't do it again. Ann, would you uh, read the meeting procedures, please? Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of April 20th, 2009. Agendas are available on the chair in the back of the meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that all pagers and cell phones be either turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. Now we'll move on to public comment. This is the time to uh, come forward and uh, discuss with the board or bring us to the, up to um, information on but we cannot take any action on on uh, any of the items that you want to talk about and please limit your comments to three minutes we'd like your name and your address for the record please okay my name is Kelly Hernandez uh, Truckee California and I'd like to thank the board for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon I appreciate it my name is Kelly Hernandez and I'm the communications supervisor for the Placer County Sheriff's Tahoe Dispatch Center on the Public Safety Dispatch Study recommending consolidation of the Tahoe and Auburn Dispatch Centers. I'm here today to confirm these crucial factors have been considered before consolidation occurs. North Lake Tahoe is a resort community with a fluctuating population that goes from 12,000 permanent residents to over 100,000 tourists on summer and winter weekends. Tahoe's unique geography is very complex with limited access due to adverse weather conditions as well as thousands of miles of off-road trails. The tourists come to Tahoe for a variety of extreme sports such as skiing, mountain biking, hiking, hang gliding, and many varied water sports. While enjoying these outdoor activities, many of the tourists become lost, injured, and disoriented and rely on the knowledge of the local emergency workers to rescue them. The rescue process starts with the dispatcher. Because of the local knowledge and repeated first-hand experience of the Tahoe geography that the Tahoe dispatchers possess, countless lives have been saved. These visitors continue to come to this beautiful area year after year. The Auburn dispatchers are extremely professional and competent. However, they're understaffed and already working mandatory overtime each week. If this consolidation occurs, Auburn's current staff will absorb Tahoe's workload and call volume, but not Tahoe's staff causing even more overtime. This overwork and resulting fatigue coupled with the geographical complexities could compromise the safety of the officers and the public we serve. I'd like to read a couple of the comments captured on a blog by Eastern Placer County residents. Diana Harriman wrote, I worked with the Placer County Superior Court for 10 years and I have seen firsthand what the Tahoe 911 Dispatch Center does. They not only all have personal knowledge of the area but some of the people in the area have lived here for many, many years. Sometimes just a name gives them all the information they need. Richard Bazio says, the proposed closing of the 911 local Placer County Sheriff Dispatch Center is exceedingly short-sighted and dangerous. Our local dispatchers are an integral part and necessary part of our small community. North Tahoe is unique and diversified from its climate, geography, people, and location. Local dispatchers bring a succinct understanding of these entities and better serve our community's emergency and law enforcement needs, keep our dispatchers local, and continue to safeguard our residents, visitors, and sheriff's personnel. Wally Auerbach wrote, many visitors don't know exactly where they are and in a crisis situation that could make the task of locating them very difficult. Our peak population is made up of visitors. 
And Laura Rosio wrote, we have extreme fluctuations in seasonal and weekend population, high altitude sports activities, encroaching city type crimes and demands that are extraordinary to our unique region. We draw worldwide attention. Why would we want to change what is not broken to save a few dollars that consultants suggest would help streamlining services? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kim Bromley, and uh, address is 2501 North Lake Boulevard, as well as 434 Lewis Avenue in Homewood. I am not only a public safety dispatcher for Placer County, Lake Tahoe, but I'm also a property owner. First of all, I would like to thank the board for taking my comment into consideration today. I'm here to discuss the matrix study results and also respectfully request the board to reconsider consolidation of our two dispatch centers. There are several facts that were included in the matrix study that I believe justifies the existence of the Tahoe Dispatch Center. Number one, calls for service. The study reported 47,000 community generated calls for service between both centers. According to the Sheriff's Administration, the actual number of calls was nearly 200,000, which puts, puts matrix calculation 75% less than the Sheriff's Department recognized statistics. Number two, staffing. The matrix consulting firm made a re recommendation that if Placer County chose to consolidate, the dispatch department should reduce its mandatory staffing from 37 total personnel to 29. The Tahoe Dispatch Center is already operating at six dispatchers, which is at half its total allocation. As of April 6, April, uh, excuse me, Auburn had 16 full-time dispatchers working the desk, not including approximately four administrative and supervisory positions. That brings a total of approximately 26 people working in both centers now. That would mean that our collective dispatch centers have already exceeded the recommendations by matrix to reduce our staffing numbers. Therefore, the Public Safety Communications Department is already saving the county money. Number three, public safety, public safety, public safety. We're in the business of keeping the public safe. Once again, the dispatchers in Auburn are highly trained and qualified. However, I have personally lived and worked in Tahoe, in the Tahoe Basin for almost 18 years. I have lived in Kings Beach, Tahoe City, Tahoma, Homewood, Cedar Flat, and Squaw Valley. I have walked lost visitors out of the woods and back to safety during the course of a cell phone conversation. I have provided verbal driving instructions to someone having a heart attack who had no idea where they were in the first place. Yes, Auburn dispatchers can train and do some ride-alongs to increase their knowledge of the area. However, the 85-mile geographical divide will make the training inconvenient at best. Number four, recommendations. The matrix study left the county to choose from two recommendations. As we already know, the first proposal is to consolidate both dispatch centers. The alternate recommendation is to staff the Tau City Dispatch Center with one position 24-7 for a minimum staffing level. The Tahoe Dispatch Center is prepared and capable to take on this recommendation while still providing a high level of service to the community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa May Duggan. I'm from beautiful Kings Beach. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for um, the dedication ceremony this morning. Um, we all hope that that's the start of something huge, and I think it will. Um, but I'm here today to talk, to update you just on an initiative that was recently executed by the Truckee Tahoe Community Foundation, of which I'm a board member. Um, it was called the Call to Action. And on March 15th, 27 phone bank coordinators coordinated 24 locations with 271 volunteers on the phone, many of whom are in the room. Thank you, Jennifer and Peter Kratz and Ann Bryant's here. We did an amazing job. There were 839 unique contributors to our effort to help those in our community who need help. We're in some really desperate times up here. Those 839 people combined to um, contribute $115,000.
It was three hours. Um, it was an amazing <laughs> initiative. And I thought you should know that this is going on right here in our backyard. Um, and many, many thanks to everybody who helped. Thank you. Hello. First, I have to ask you a quick question. Since I'm speaking for 1,500 people, do I get five minutes? No, okay. My name is Ann Bryant. I'm the executive director of the Bear League. I'll try and get this down to three minutes. Um, I'm absolutely appalled at the thought of moving the dispatch center to Auburn. I work very closely with the sheriff's department in all of the counties around the basin. I have for 10 years, almost 11 now. Uh, we have a wonderful working relationship with all of our dispatchers. In the evening when that line gets transferred to Auburn, and a bearer call comes in, they are very unfamiliar with the areas and how to react to a bearer call. Any bearer call to someone who lives in a city is a, an emergency. Our dispatchers know what is an emergency and what isn't. We get called to assist them when it is an emergency or we call them when it is. Our dispatchers here, our local ones, know when a bear walks through the, your yard it's nothing to freak out about. It's not an emergency, and you know life goes on. And they know how to calm these people down and refer them to the Bear League. We also handle a 24-hour-a-day dispatch out of our office. So it's going to create a huge problem with bear calls, which are already a big enough problem as it is. But our staff here in the Tahoe City office knows how to handle it. I'm also um, very disturbed with the thought that we spent $80,000 on a consultant who didn't bother to ask any of us what our opinions were and how we felt about this being moved down there. Uh, quickly, one other problem that I have is that we're already having a lot of problems economically, as, as the whole country is. Why would you want to pound another nail in the coffin of the Tahoe area by taking jobs that are local people, knowing what they're doing, and moving it down to the city? And I want to warn you, we will, if this kind of action continues, you take this as a threat if you'd like to, but I'd, I'd prefer to call it a warning. We will grab Jennifer, our Jennifer, and we will take her and we will form our own county. We do not need to be consolidated with Auburn anymore if you're going to treat us like we're a separate you know, place up here that brings money in and it all goes down to Auburn. We want our dispatch center left in Tau City where it belongs, and I am very serious about that. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, Ann's a tough act to follow. Uh, my name is Pete Banson. I'm the chief of Squaw Valley Fire Department, um, 305 Squaw Valley Road, 96146. I've been involved in the fire service in the Lake Tahoe area since 1980, which was well before we had centralized dispatch. In those days, someone who had an emergency in our district called 583-4231. The phone rang in the station. A big red bell went off, and whomever was working answered the phone. We've seen enormous improvements in the last 30 years, and I would be distressed to see the county take a step backward instead of continuing to improve the level of service afforded to the communities in this area. In my professional opinion, based on observation and experience, closing the Tahoe Dispatch Center would be a step backward. In theory, a dispatcher in Auburn receiving the same information from a reporting party and running the same CAD would achieve the same outcome as a dispatcher in Tahoe City. Our experience over the three years that Auburn Dispatch has handled our calls for part of each week has not proved that theory correct. Time and again, we struggled with a lack of familiarity for the geography and topography of this area and the function of the radio system. These were all easy routine calls. What about the extraordinary call? The Washua Angora fire, a high-speed pursuit over roads the dispatcher is seen only on a map. What happens when the CAD fails? As emergency managers, we're expected to manage the extraordinary with the same facility that we bring to the routine. A dispatcher at a distance is simply unable to bring the same level of skill and initiative to a situation as someone who knows the area intimately. If the easy calls don't go smoothly, what are we to expect 
in an extraordinary situation. For the better part of 30 years, I've trusted the dispatchers on the other end of the radio with my safety and that of my crews and the people of our communities have had confidence that when they called 911, someone would come and make their bad situation better. The Tahoe dispatchers have earned that confidence even though it hasn't been easy. They've had to work incredible hours, cover for one another because no one else could, whatever it took to keep the center open and operating for the people who were placing their trust in that voice on the other end of the radio or the telephone. Now the county has hit an economic speed bump and it seems that the kind of loyalty, dedication and responsibility that the Tahoe dispatchers exemplify doesn't count for very much. I'm sure that the county's economic situation is difficult, but the test of our character as public officials and frankly as people comes when times are hard, not when they're easy. Closing the Tahoe Dispatch Center would have a negative effect on public safety and on the safety of county employees. It's a poorly informed, ill-advised response to a temporary condition that will likely have serious long-term implications. Thank you. George Custer, I'm sorry to say it's nothing to do with dispatch. Um, I'm a King's Beach resident. Um, I just wanted to make some com public comments on the housing element just to provide some feedback. Um, as many of you know, I've been in engaged in the whole affordable housing uh, movement here and efforts in Kings Beach and Tahoe and Truckee for many years. Um, one of the things that I've spoken about in the past is trying to create some kind of a permanent financial mechanism for affordable housing. And uh, one of the uh, recommendations I would make to the supervisors is what the town of Mammoth has done. It's increased its TOT by 1%. And what that's done is it's provided around $800,000 annually. And for that, they've actually uh, been able to use those funds and leverage both state and federal funds. And it's, uh, it's actually helped them build 124 units of new housing uh, and 48 ownership of those and 76 rentals. So some of the other things, um, I know we've been trying to do it on the back of real estate transactions, and we're getting obviously pushed back from the realtor community as well as developers, et cetera. And so I think we should just share the love of affordable housing and try to do things like increase gas taxes and increase sales tax along with um, in lieu fees instead of trying to make people actually build units on um, site. So an in lieu fee based on an actual market rate and those fees can go into a pool and then the, the money that's available for redevelopment or uh, affordable housing developers to come in and actually build homes um, you know, in complexes um, that are walkable, of course, within um, our, our communities itself. And then I think last but not least, and I know uh, everyone's working on this, is the TRPA zoning inside the basin. So we really need to increase our density by 25 to 30 units per acre. We need to um, bump our heights up above 29 feet to three or four stories. And we need to allow mixed use, you know, the whole mixed use piece that you've heard a lot in our place-based planning. So I know Jennifer's been working on that, and I think it's really important that we as a county really push hard for trying to get those changes made um, because, again, it ties back into our walkable um, place-based planning that the community was really in favor of. And then I think inclusionary zoning, it's been out there for four or five years. It would be great to either try to do something and actually get it on the books and make it perhaps something more workable. And then last but not least, you know, we, we have, um, what, 16 different members of the redevelopment staff. I think it would be great to have at least three here in our area, one in redevelopment, one in housing, and one in economic development. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. My name is Gloria Burke, and I live on the west shore of Tahoe. We are facing, unfortunately, another dry summer in front of us. I always call it a white knuckle summer. Every time I hear an, a siren go by my house on 89, I think to myself, oh my Lord, is that going to be a heart or a tree? And if we don't have knowledgeable people that are working in our dispatch areas, I will really freak. <laughs> Um, you have to know only from a, a, a fire standpoint, you have to know exactly within a matter of seconds where that fire is doing damage, the best way to get to it, the best way to get out, et cetera, et cetera. And I really think 
that it would be a, a, a serious mistake if we took our dispatch unit and put them down almost 150 miles away. Thank you. I will close public comment. We will take up our two o'clock item. The first one is the uh, county executive biomass update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable supervisors and, and management, the CEO. Uh, maybe have a little update today on uh, where we are in the biomass program. Hope I get the clicker right. I did. <clears throat> first of all, a little bit about our biomass facility progress. As, as you all, I think, know, we were fortunate to receive nearly a $1.5 million uh, grant from uh, Senator Feinstein, which actually was proposed by Congressman Doolittle prior to his leaving office. So you should all be congratulated for the work you all put in on that effort. What, what we're going to use that for is literally a down payment on the technology, and I'll talk a little bit about where we're headed on that. But that will be $1.5 million of, of about a $5 million technology effort. We recently had a letter of, of interest from Sierra Pacific Power. There is a gentleman from Sierra Pacific Power in the audience that would like to speak to you after I'm done. Um, and essentially what they're asking to do is move forward in a more formal process uh, to develop a public-private partnership with us for this potential facility. The DOE grant has, is progressing very well, and that, if you'll remember, is the money that Congressman Doolittle was able to get for us through a DOE Department of Energy grant, about a half million dollars. And what we've been able to do so far, uh, it, uh, we've been able to do a study that show we will be able to eat, meet all air emissions in the Tahoe region. And uh, we know that for one, me for one megawatt, potentially for two, and we're, at this point we're still trying to size the location or the, or the size of the technology. The economics are looking very good. As a matter of fact, we've done some pro formas that show that this facility can be independent of anything else. I know we've talked about it being a part of a county uh, facility that's going to be built. Um, that would enhance the economics of it, but the electrical uh, generation itself would be self-sustaining. There's also a heat aspect of that, which we will be uh, attempting to utilize to heat buildings, which can be sold in, in lieu of natural gas. So it actually creates a heat market. This is widely accomplished in Europe and is very successful. We hope to do that here as well. And it can even be used for such things as heating the sidewalk or roads to help with um, the snow loads here in the winter. We have a new site that we're looking at uh, with, with much greater potential in the Kings Beach area. Uh, and we have a potential couple of sites, but we're looking at that one specifically right now to make sure that it will meet within all of the guidelines that you have all set out for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are, um, I'll talk about it in a sec. Technology is progressing, and the nice thing about technology in this environment is it's getting better, it's getting more reliable, more affordable, um, and, it, and we are getting more options. At one point about a year ago, we only had one option. Now we're looking at three separate technologies that we might have options for. And again, for a 24 by 7 operation, not just as a demonstration unit. So by the time we go out to RFP for this in a little over a year from now, hopefully we'll have those three viable and potentially more options to look at. Right now we're working with many departments in Placer County, uh, the Tahoe office, the redevelopment office, uh, uh, roads, maintenance, parks, uh, you name it in the county, people are understanding that they, this can be uh, a project that everyone can contribute to. We're putting together the elements we need to, for a pre-development meeting, which at some point we will go to TRPA and talk about what it is we have, what it is they want us to put that together, and then we'll be back before you all um, sometime soon with the, the information for that. A little bit on the ongoing programs that you have uh, allowed us to, to work forward. The Community Biomass Collection Program has been a huge success. Um, we have expanded from biomass boxes in certain communities to now regional pickup areas, and in fact, we're going more towards that. We had a lot more bang for our buck, so to speak, but we're also turning people's minds around and not to burn, if at all possible, if they don't need to, but to put in the collection areas that we can then uh, turn into electricity and, uh, and create that. We're getting grants uh, just last week. We received two new grants from the Air Pollution Control District for the regional biomass collection and a second one for work on removing biomass removal on the National Forest. 
We also were able to pick up uh, the U.S. Forest Service now. We have a contract, which you have seen and signed, that allows us to utilize some of their funds with some of the funds that uh, we've been able to pick up uh, in grants and start removing those piles that sit on the national forest that would have, would have be burned, particularly here in Tahoe. Uh, we concentrated a little bit here last year, but mostly in Forest Hill. Now we're going to kind of reverse the role and start a large operation up here in the basin. Um, we also have a Sierra Nevada Conservancy grant that, that was for this. We have another larger one in um, that will work in the uh, uh, American River watershed we hope to get by the end of this year. And right now, we're one of the few organizations that have contracts in place, meaning I, we have contractors that can go do this work for a good value and put people back to work. We have material that's being reclaimed, and I'll show you what we did in the basin last summer here in a second. And we are saving uh, pollution from going into the air and other facets. And we, there's some of our partners, the Air Pollution Control District has contributed heavily. The, the Forest Service is coming on now with money, but a lot of support. You, of course, the board has, has done great. And then the Sierra Nevada Conservancy is becoming a good partner with us. A little bit on the project up here in the basin. Um, last year, we did this regional biomass removal in the Tahoe Basin. Originally, we set out to have five or six of these regional locations. We didn't end up with that many. We ended up with four. Uh, we were going to do one over in Nevada, and it just didn't get worked out, and another parking lot area didn't work out. But we did uh, set up at, at uh, the Tahoe Public Utilities District. We set up at um, Homewood. We set up at Alpine Meadows, and we set up right here at North Star. And all of the fire districts and the utility districts were very uh, good to work with us and uh, pointed a lot of their material to go over there and what uses they may have for it. Worked very strongly with the North Tahoe Fire Protection District on this program. What we processed and transported, and the contract, we did about 330 bone dry tons. And to give you an example, about 28 to 30 tons goes in one of those big, huge possum belly trucks. So that's kind of an example. We took material to Loyalton when it was at this end, and then we had um, the Carson City facility, which has a small biomass facility, was in need of some material. So we allowed our contractor to send some of it over that way. It was the summer months, so, uh, and he did it in off hours, so there was no issue with traffic. And uh, we were real successful over there. But the other side we did, um, we also chipped it, and uh, North Star actually wanted it to stabilize their ski slopes and some of their trail areas. So we moved 229 bone dry tons right to there. And we did that from their piles that the North Star fire chief had put together from this general area. So we, again, try to remain as localized as possible to have uh, as few a trucks on the road as possible. And we, it was a very good relationship with North Star. So consequently, when you see the numbers, we actually did better than we normally do because, again, half of it was not uh, created into energy but used on the ground. So the, the, the levels of, of uh, particularly carbon and um, NOx went up tremendously uh, because, again, we didn't put it through a facility. But as you can see, we had, in, in a di as if it would have been op open burn, anywhere from 73 to 99 percent reduction. So we're seeing a very large consistency. Two years ago when I came before you, we, those numbers were out of a book that we thought would happen. And now after a couple of years of doing this, we are verifying all of those numbers and they are exceeding in some cases what we thought we'd do. Um, and we are removing lots of material without putting pollution into the air or very little. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little bit about what's going to happen this year or potentially to happen. Um, stimulus funding. We're all out there looking to see how we can put people back to work. Well, the, uh, the U.S. Forest Service was um, given or, or suggested that they were going to get a large amount of money uh, country, around the country to be specifically used for biomass. Well, the managers in the Tahoe National Forest, the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit, which of course is represented up here, and even the Pacific Southwest region, which is essentially California, Oregon, Nevada, or uh, Washington, and Hawaii, they came to Little Placer County because they realized what kind of efficiency we have, and they also realized we have contracts with real people that can get people back to work. So all three organizations have come to us and asked us, if, what, what would it take to remove the materials in the next 18 months, and how much would that cost? And so we've worked with them, and we put in a proposal um, to look at, Again, it's stimulus dollars. I have no idea what the actual number would be, but it could potentially be a half million to two million dollars that would flow through us, flowing to contractors to actually get this material out of the woods, grind it, haul it off for electricity, or we could potentially, if ski slopes need it. 
And that's just a tremendous, uh, I think, honor to the county and specifically you supervisors that you have led in this task. And we are now in a position where uh, the U.S. government is looking at us essentially as a private contractor because we've been able to put this money directly on the ground and get results. So um, hopefully that will come through. Again, I don't know how much or when it will come through, but uh, I keep being assured any day now have your contractors ready to go. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did submit a grant to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, and our partners are Placer County Water Agency, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, and the U U.S. Forest Service. And what we've done is taken a look at the projects that the U.S. Forest Service has already gone through NEPA, or shortly will go through NEPA to do forest thinnings in the, mostly in the uh, middle fork of the American River, but also the north fork of the American River. And their goal is to clean up those for, ob for obvious reasons, fire protection, watershed restoration, uh, general forest health, et cetera. And what we've done is we've partnered with them and asked for money from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, and we're bringing money to it through grants and um, some other monies that it looks like we're going to get, potentially the stimulus funds. And we are going to dovetail with their work of forest thinning, and rather than, again, where they usually have to leave it on the ground due to economics, we're going to be picking it up, hauling it, and creating green energy out of it. So that's an exciting program. Um, hopefully the state's position on Prop 84 and other bond funding will change by then. This is due to be awarded potentially at the September meeting, um, so it would likely be in the follow-on year. But we are, if we get the stimulus money, we're actually going to start this grant and show them that we're already putting matching dollars into it. So that's something that we could be doing at the end of this year, and it's a three-year program. Something called ecosystems credits. This is kind of new. I haven't brought it up to you before. It's, it's, it's something that um, a lot of people around the world are looking at. And, the easiest way to describe it is, um, as you know, you, you as a board have put some money towards looking at um, modeling the air pollution through uh, Doc Burton's program. And uh, what could happen there is if the modeling is correct and we show a 25 percent reduction in uh, air pollution saved by not burning or preventing fires, you will see a corresponding percentage drop in health care, specifically asthma and other lung-related data, which, of course, would mean that our health care costs could potentially drop. Well, that piece of it is what's known as an ecosystem credit. It's a credit that is not valued currently by anyone. In other words, no one's funding it. But what we, in our intention, and we're, again, we're working with people nationwide, is to utilize the data we have and give it to them so at some point, rather than um, paying for health care costs at the, at the back end, if we could move some of that data to the front end to help clean up the air and clean up the forest, you will spend less in the back. So essentially like a carbon credit or anything else that you would sell that and utilize the money up front. So that's – and there, there's – you know, any estimates from 10 to 15 of these different types of credits that you can gain out of just the forest and the water and that sort of thing. So we have met with the Forest Service. They are very interested in our program. We have one of the few programs that's actually getting on the ground material moved and real statistical reliable data for where they want to go with that. So we are being looked at as sort of a beta site or incubator to help this process. So we could see potentially some money or some relationships building for money down the line to continue this good work. <clears throat> Other counties support. I mention this because um, sometimes that's a good and a bad thing. Other counties like what we're doing, so Brett gets to spend a few minutes on the road every once in a while to go to other counties. But the nice thing about it is they're, they're asking for our data, they're asking how we put this program together, and they're asking for our help to build similar programs around this state. And that's, I think, ultimately what your vision was, is let's clean our area up and let's help other people to do it. So it is working, and uh, again, we applaud the board for that. That's all I have. Uh, any, I'll answer any questions or anything else. Any comments? Jennifer? Do I need to? Do I need to turn this on? Okay, thank you. Um, Brett, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation, but more importantly, thank you so much for helping bring me up to speed on this because obviously it's of crucial importance to District 5, whether it's Forest Hill, Dutch Flat, or here at, in the, at the lake. Um, just thank you again for, you know, your mentoring, helping me um, to help you, to help all of us move this process along. Um, we will be meeting with Assemblyman Gaines and uh, presenting uh, a PowerPoint to him in two weeks, I believe, three weeks almost. 
if, if, if we don't cancel again. Um, and um, just wanted to let the public and the rest of the board know that we are working, Brett and I and others, very hard to bring the state and other federal and other county entities into this process because we, we realize that this has to be something that is absolutely regional in scale and scope. We can't just focus on the lake. We can't just focus on Placer County. But as Brett has said, we need to be a model for other counties. We need to be able to, after we go through this process and get our feet under us, be able to provide it to other governmental agencies, whether they're counties, cities, or states, and say, here's a process to make this work. And we've done the groundwork for you. Now please. Please help us to, to take this to the rest of, of certainly the West and probably the entire U.S. So just really thank you. Thanks for your help. Here a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Mr. District, good work. Mr. Chair, before you go, Brad, if you could to go back to the chart that looks like this, I just want to make sure for those who eventually see this that it's you stated what I believe the chart shows. I know I wanted to test your technical skills first. There we, there we go. That those percentages that are in blocks there, the 96, 73, 97, those are reductions in yes. those outputs. Yes. yes, what happens is we compare everything we do to what if, if it were lit off, which is what it naturally is. Those piles were scheduled to be burned. Every pile we picked up was going to be burned. So the amount of, of reduction, for example, for particulate matter, 10 micrometer, I forget what it is, the stuff that sticks into your lungs. We've reduced that by 96.6 percent over what would have happened over the next year or two if those piles would have been burned. Same for NOx, carbon, and volatile organic chemicals. Yes. Right. Got it. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next item is the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. He's getting it. Okay. There you oh, are. There I am. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm, I'm here today uh, giving you a status report update on the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and um, providing you with a little bit of a progress report. As I think you'll see throughout the presentation, the TRPA is experiencing uh, quite a bit of change as it poises to update its regional plan and embark on, on another 20 years of land use planning and environmental protection in the Tahoe area. Okay, this is a mystery. Is it going to be? Oh, my gosh. Brett and I are both so smart. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that all of you have seen this before, so I'm going to whiz through this part pretty fast here. Uh, the TRPA, as you know, was originally created in the 1960s when govern the governors of both states, California and Nevada, as well as lawmakers, approved a bi-state compact that created the the TRPA to oversee um, planning and development in the Tahoe area. In 1969, the U.S. Congress ratified an agreement that created the TRPA. Uh, this compact was revised in 1980 and gave the TRPA authority to adopt very specific environmental quality standards that they call thresholds to enforce ordinances designed to achieve those standards. And in 1987, the governing board adopted its first regional plan, which is still in effect today. I wanted to talk to you about the local government's interaction with the TRPA. Um, oftentimes, people wonder exactly how we fit in. And we fit in, actually, in, in several different ways. Um, first and foremost, your Board of Supervisors appoints somebody to the Governing Board, that's Jennifer, and I'll provide you with a brief history on her later, as you'll see. <laughs> She's going to love it. <laughs> um, in addition to the, to the appointment to the Governing Board, your Board also has an appointment to the Advisory Planning Commission, which acts much like our Planning Commission. I am that appointment in Placer County. The Planning Director also has an appointment and that appointment is Paul Thompson. So Paul, Paul and I also represent Placer County on the Advisory Planning Commission. Um, in addition, the, the local governments are tasked with implementing TRPA's environmental improvement program. 
They've got a, a very large list of projects that are expected to be implemented over the next, <coughs> excuse me, 20 or so years um, that should it, at some point create uh, threshold attainment. Are you going to grab my water for me? Thank you. <laughs> That's, that'd be easier. Thanks a lot, Rich. I've had a cold for the past few days. That's why I brought my water bottle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in addition to implementing those projects, which are, by the way, um, sometimes completed with local money, sometimes completed with federal and state grants, we, we also have other interaction with, with TRPA. Um, our uh, planning department, Community Development Resources Agency, has three MOUs with TRPA to help um, implement project review and project implementation for your everyday projects, not just the EIP projects. Excuse me. Ah, that felt great. Uh, I wanted to go back uh, for a second to the, the EIP projects. Um, you may wonder what Plaster County's commitment to those projects are other than having entire staffs that, that um, are operated by the Department of Public Works to implement those projects. We spend about $18 million every two years implementing those projects, again, with the local, state, and federal funds. So it's quite an, a significant workload. It's quite a significant commitment on the part of Placer County to participate in implementing those projects that meet environmental thresholds. Um, something I, I thought you might be interested, as the five of you are, are used to voting, you need three people to make something happen. The TRPA things work a little bit differently. Uh, because they have appointees to both the California delegation and the Nevada delegation, in some cases they require what's called a supermajority vote, <coughs> excuse me, to pass anything. Um, each, each state has seven appointments, um, or seven appointees, because they're from different organizations. You don't just need four votes in, in every case. In the case of a project, you need what's called a supermajority. So for instance, with the Kings Beach project, we needed a total of five votes from the California delega delegation and a total of nine for the entire governing board to approve that project. And with any project in any state, that's the way that goes. So it's not just a majority, it's a supermajority. I wanted to familiarize you a little bit with the current governing board members. Alan Biaggi is the chair. He is the director of the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. He has been on the board since 2004 and um, has also been a, a chair before. This is his second time holding the chair position. Donna Ruthie is the one of the... Um, the Nevada governor appointee. She is a businesswoman out of the Las Vegas area. She and her husband, Chuck, have a home in Incline Village. Tim Cashman, I'll provide you a little bit more information on him because he is a new member and I'm going to um, provide more detail for new members, is the Nevada at-large appointee. The um, Nevada at-large appointments are appointed by the total of the Nevada contingent on the governing board. So all of the Nevada members appoint the Nevada at-large member. And then Ross Miller is the Nevada Secretary of State. He's appointed himself. The, the total governing board uh, members are 15. And as I mentioned, seven are from California and seven are from Nevada. There's also a non-voting member who is appointed by the President of the United States. On the California side, Mara Bresnik is the California Speaker appointee. Byron Shear, a new member, recently appointed uh, by the Nevada Senate Rules Committee. Stephen Merrill, one of two California governor appointees. And you'll notice that there are two governor appointees on the California side as opposed to one as there is on the Nevada side. And the second California governor appointee um, position is vacant. So if you know of anybody who's interested. Um, on our on of local government appointees, it's um, generally and in most cases the uh, the person who represents the Tahoe area sits on the governing board. That is the case right now. It's not always the case. Shelley Aldean is the appointee of the city and county of Carson City. You may wonder what Carson City what interest they have in the Tahoe Basin. They actually own a little sliver of land 
between the Washoe County line and the Douglas County line. It's on the east shore. It's maybe a couple miles long. You might drive through it on Highway 28 if you're heading south from Incline Village to South Lake Tahoe. There are no residents there, um, but hence they have a seat on the governing board and an interest in what happens in the Tahoe Basin. Nancy McDermott is a D Douglas County Commissioner. John Bretternitz, Washoe County Commissioner. Norma Santiago, she's the Vice Chair of the Governing Board and also Supervisor from El Dorado County representing the Tahoe District area. Hal Cole is uh, appointed by the City of South Lake Tahoe. He's a councilman there. And of course, Jennifer Montgomery, appointed by your board. Got some pictures here of the new governing board members. So of the 15 members, there are five new members at this point, and there are, I call it two vacancies. The presidential appoint, appointment isn't really vacant. Um, we, we are assuming that uh, President Obama is going to appoint a new person. That the person is still technically in the seat, but we're, we're expecting that one to be appointed, reappointed at some point in the near future here. Um, a little bit on John uh, Bretternitz. He replaces Jim Galloway, who served as a Washoe County seat um, appointment for more than a decade. Um, Commissioner Bretternitz uh, used to be in the construction business, had spent 20 years in that business, uh, most recently as an executive vice president of Q&D Construction. And uh, you can see his list of participation in local government and nonprofits. It's really quite impressive. Timothy Cashman is the um, the current um, at-large Nevada appointee. He has um, longtime family business ties in the Las Vegas area. That's where he calls his home. He's interestingly vice president of two Las Vegas Harley Davidson dealerships, and um, his family has been in the um, construction and automotive business for quite some time in the Las Vegas area. He also was formerly the chairman of the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce. I don't get, I have too many things in my hands here, <laughs> juggling. Um, got two more California members here. Byron Shear actually um, re replaced uh, former governing board member Jerry Waldy. He unfortunately passed away earlier this month. I was a longtime member of the governing board. I believe he served back as far as 1992, one of the longer term governing board members. Byron Shear earned his law degree from Harvard in 1952, was a professor of law at Stanford. Nine years um, of service with the Palo Alto City Council, two of those terms as mayor. So he's got a lot of local government experience, which is, is important to us. And he was also a California Assemblyman from 1980 to 1995. So a lot of connections in the state of California. Hal Cole, this is his second term actually on the governing board. He served previously from 1997 to 2004. It's also his second term as a city councilman. Uh, he's a contractor, uh, been in the area for decades. Uh, he was elected just most recently, um, just last November. He also serves on the Barton Memorial Hospital Board. Barton Memorial is the um, hospital district on the south side of the lake. This is my personal favorite slide. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you about Jennifer Montgomery? <laughs> As you know, she was elected in November um, to the Board of Supervisors, um, formerly a small business owner, board member of the Placer Hills Education Council, graduated from Mills College. I hesitated on putting the year there. I hope that doesn't upset you. <laughs> it was... <laughs> Uh, and she, in addition to serving uh, as your board representative on the governing board, she also sits on TRPA's operations and local government committees. And here I mentioned the two vacancies. So, so as you can see, shaping up with the with uh, TRPA, they've got a lot of, of things happening, and uh, a lot of new blood on the governing board to lead that way. Part of that new blood as their staff person, you might recognize that picture of the woman sitting right there, Joanne Marquetta, was appointed just last month, um, unanimously I should say, to uh, replace former executive director John Singlob, who departed in January. Um, and, and Joanne will probably be making some remarks at the end of my presentation too, um, to let you know a little bit more about who she is and what we've got here. Um, she has served as TRPA's general counsel since June of 2005 
and also previously um, served as general counsel of Presidio Trust in San Francisco. Joanne began her legal career as a trial attorney and worked for U.S. EPA and is also a member of the Urban Land Institute. So she's got varied experience. I wanted to talk to you a little bit, too, about the, the regional plan update. This, this is something that, that uh, TRPA has been working on, the local government partners have been working on with TRPA staff and board um, for about four years now. Uh, in 2005, the TRPA reached out to local governments and asked for us to participate in the update of its regional plan, which we all expected to be complete in 2007. Um, few bumps and and whatnot along the way as to always be expected in the Tahoe Basin. So that, that plan is still being worked on. They do have um, now a clear uh, number of alternatives that, that they are looking at for the 20-year the update of their 1987 plan. And uh, Placer County has really been a significant in part, in partner in the development of that plan, and we can continue to do that. We've tar participated in place-based planning, which we've discussed with you before. Um, talks about how you can get local character as part of a regional plan and vision. Um, we've, we've helped with funding efforts on the place-based planning and been very participatory in bringing that out to the community and also getting community input into what folks want in their communities. Um, the place-based planning was really the driver for the community enhancement project concept, the kind of demonstration project in advance of the regional plan. Um, concept, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute, too. At currently, TRP expects the plan to be approved by 2010. As you can see, there are kind of five alternatives, five, four and a half, maybe we want to call it. Um, the first alternative is the baseline, and that really is existing conditions with no changes at all, no increased development, no new development. It uh, establishes a baseline, really, for their environmental impact analysis. And this is when the alternatives start getting a little interesting, at least for kind of a planning geek like I am. Uh, this is the no action alternative continues with the current regional plan, the one that's been in place since 1987. No additional allocations, but all unused allocations under the 87 plan would be ultimately allocated. And that includes um, residential allocations, commercial floor area, of course, the CEP projects that we have supported would continue to go forward if approved. Um, the current transfer programs would continue, and um, there would be a maintenance of the existing nine threshold standards. Under alternative two, uh, really, I think the goal of, of all of the alternatives from here on out is to accelerate attainment of the thresholds through some sort of infill, either within smaller nodes or within the larger kind of existing con community plan framework. The alternative two would allow as many as 4,500 residential units over the next 20 years. And this really proposes to concentrate mixed use development in nine nodes basin wide. Two of those are in Placer County, one in Kings Beach, one in Tahoe C City. Um, this alternative proposes to allow development to occur through height and density incentives that would also create um, pedestrian-oriented development that would reduce the reliance on the automobile and then hence improve air quality and water quality. This alternative also considers a required irrevocable commitment. You guys probably jumped right to that line. Um, for water quality improvements prior to development. In other words, they'd be asking local governments, sign on the dotted line, you will commit to doing these water quality improvements before we allow you to use the allocations for residential commercial development. And it also proposed, proposes to restore residential communities to 1980s levels. A lot of folks um, during the public outreach component of TRPA's um, uh, community events, folks have, have really voiced a concern about the reduction in full-time residents and the real leaning toward the second home and that sort of thing. Um, at some point, we'll probably put a little bit more meat on this bone and understand how this would happen, because frankly, I don't think we have an answer to that yet, and this is one of the things that, that your 
uh, county staff has commented on. We need some more information. How, how would this happen? Uh, but that's what the proposal includes right now. Alternative three, um, rather than focusing on the nine more dense and smaller nodes, it uses the existing community plan areas. Uh, right now we have those in Tahoe City, Kings Beach, Tahoe Vista, Carnelian Bay. Placer County has a com uh, West Shore community plan, general plan. That is not recognized by TRPA, so it's not included on this list. This would allow for as many as 5,200 new residential units. There's a real emphasis in this alternative on private and local implementation of the environmental improvement program and less on uh, dependency on state and um, federal resources. Of course, you might ask, well, where's the money going to come from? And that's some, certainly a question that, that we've been asking. Um, how can we make that commitment um, in order to get the, the environmental improvements completed? And, and while we have some ideas, it, of course, in California, you need a two-thirds majority for anybody to increase fees. So that's a real question that we have, if, if it's really going to rely on local and private investment. Um, the allocations would be very performance-based. In other words, if you do your environmental improvement projects, you can get more development allocation. And um, even more, more so looking at local jurisdiction implementation than the alternative to. A lot of papers to juggle here on this small stage. Let's see. Alternative four, again, acceleration of threshold attainment through infill. The maximum number of new residential units um, proposed under this alternative is 2,600. This further reduces the concentration of mixed-use development from nine in alternative two to five nodes basin-wide, so there would be one in Placer County. Um, the proposal is that that would be in Kings Beach, so there would only be one kind of urban, if you want to call it that, area where there would be mixed-use incentives for development. Uh, in this alternative, they propose emphasis on state and federal implementation of the Environmental Improvement Program, maintaining the current visitor and resident mix, and there's also quite a bit of discussion about paid local parking and intercept lots outside of the Tahoe Basin. I guess for the North Shore, that would mean in the Truckee area. Don't tell Truckee. <laughs> Here's a, a bit of a timeline. Um, I, Joanne may be able to correct me on this. I'm not sure if this has been updated yet at, at this point, but the project description was proposed to have been released in February. They should be starting to work on the environmental impact statement, so that the analysis of these five alternatives this spring, hoping to have public comment by the fall, response to comments, and then um, governing board action on the uh, regional plan update in spring of 2010. Just a quick update on this uh, community enhancement project program. Uh, we've got three projects right now on the pipeline with TRPA. Those are the first three, the Dom Domus Affordable Housing, Homewood Mountain Resort, BBLLC. They, they've all applied to the county and to TRPA. They've all started some level of environmental review. Um, and then the, the last three projects have been given an extension to apply by TRPA. That extension goes through February 2010. And at this point, happy to entertain any questions or pass it off to Joanne. Question. Kurt? You mentioned on one slide, um, that Homewood is not considered a project at this point, what, or is it recognized as a project at this point? No, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with the project. It's a commu uh, community plan. In Placer County, the Homewood area is a community plan area, West Shore. So is that why it's not recognized as one of these nodes? Perhaps, yes. Even though what they're proposing is that that mixed use consistent with what we're hearing. Out right. Of, and so what would happen there is that they're developing a master plan because there are ski resorts that are required to do that anyway. And all of the, that development would be confined then to their property and not allowed to spread beyond the boundaries of their property because it would be specific to the master plan area. Okay. 
And then um, I believe it was alternative two was looking at an emphasis on, on creating year-round residence. You said you had some kind of a question mark as to how that was going to be accomplished. Yeah. Um, who, who has kind of championed the various alternatives as they move forward at this time or as they've developed so far? Um, you know, I, I think that the TRPA has done a lot of public outreach and has tried to assimilate the input that it's received into things that, that the community has said that they should study. Uh, a champion on that, I, I don't know that there's a particular champion. I think it's something that resonated on the North Shore, on the South Shore, throughout the community workshops is, you know, concern over we're losing our population. Now, I think that it might be a fair question to ask, well, is that something that can be regulated or not? <laughs> can you force people to move back into the basin? Or, you know, what, how do you manage that? And I think, you know, that's one of, one of our questions. Just a candid observation, I think, unless we are, unless we're about to approve Del Webb Tahoe City, um, the way that you get year-round residence is by creating year-round job opportunities. And within the basin, um, unfortunately, we've seen a reduction in industry opportunities as opposed to an increase in industry opportunities. And so uh, year-round residence would be great as long as folks understand that there have to be jobs for those folks to, uh, at which they can work. Right. So hopefully the plan addresses an economic development component that allows for those opportunities for uh, year-round industries. I think that is a great point. Thank you. Robert? Mr. Chair, if I might. Um, I noted staff had already made some comments early on on the development of these alternatives. And there were, I wouldn't call it an irregularity with Tahoe City, but there's some oddities in terms of the community plan boundaries. And I think staff comments had made four of those. How does altering an existing community plan boundary fit into these alternatives? Right now, the, there are no proposals to make any changes to existing community plan boundaries under any of the alternatives. We have specifically, um, we've, we've had a lot of comments that have gone in. That has been a specific comment on its own. And the response to date has been, it looks as if the soils on, um, on the golf course component of the, of the area may not support additional development. That's, that's where people have asked about changing that boundary um, to include the golf course. Um, that's something that, that we're working with TRPA. That's a response that we got. But that, Does that also go true for the area further down on the highway where there's already commercial development that I thought was out no. proposed for open space? The, or something different like answer. Um, actually, the, the input that they've gotten so far has is, is largely been from the Forest Service asking to change that current boundary that, that allows for recreation on that commercial property but does not um, allow the, the commercial uses. It, it recognizes the grandfathered ones. It, um, the Forest Service has further asked for that to be tightened down to only accommodate conservation uses, so not even allow recreation. So that's something that we have provided input on and have not received a specific response of whether that will be studied differently or not. I thought there was also private properties alongside the highway frontage. There are. Well. There yeah. are. That are currently privately owned. Yes. Zone commercial, they're, but does propose to be open space or something like that? Well, they, they're right now they're legal, but they're a non conforming use. So if it was changed from recreational use to conservation use, they would probably, I guess, be considered further out of conformity. So really making any changes on the, that proper, property would be very difficult, if not impossible, and that's why we've commented. But that also speaks to the ability to do economic development to provide jobs that then demand a year-round population without right. that working the right way. It's going right. somewhat backwards then, at least under the Yeah, and that actually is um, in a redevelopment area, so it's something that Placer County would normally be tar targeting for economic development, but if you can't do anything with it, it makes it nearly impossible. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for the time. And I would like to introduce Joanne Marquetta, the new executive director of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. Good afternoon, Chairman Rockholm, supervisors, members of the public, and also the county staff. 
my name is Joanne Marchetta. I was recently appointed as TRPA's new executive director. I think you heard that I am not brand new to the basin. Uh, I've been here just long enough to know how dicey politics in this area can be. Uh, but I'm actually greatly looking forward to uh, the challenge ahead of me. Um, I wanted to come here today and introduce myself, touch briefly on just a few topics of importance to the lake, uh, the basin itself, and Placer County in particular, um, and invite you to the collective basin table uh, as TRPA's partner and collaborator at the lake. I'm very much looking forward to working with Placer County and not against Placer County. Uh, as many of you know, this is TRPA's 40th anniversary year. Uh, and I have been urging people to take a look at that last 40 years and assess our accomplishments. And I am not an apologist for TRPA. Uh, I believe that TRPA can declare success. And if we look at, it, at this at the 30,000 foot level, I believe that our chief accomplishments to date have been in seeing that development in this basin has been environmentally sensitive and environmentally compatible, given the very sensitive alpine environment that we uh, thrive in here. In addition, another one of our major accomplishments was that 10 years ago, TRPA launched the Environmental Improvement Program. And through that program, we invited and secured and have in fact now invested just over a billion dollars in environmental improvements in the basin. Because of this work, what we're now seeing is that the lake is actually recovering. Some of you may note that uh, recently the new clarity numbers uh, for the lake came out a couple of months ago. And what those numbers are now showing us is that clarity is leveling off and starting to hold steady. So that billion dollars worth of investment may in fact be working uh, to reverse that decline. But in looking at the past, we have to say the past was primarily about growth control. It was about setting bounds on our growth. But the basin now is virtually at build out. We're very close to build out. Uh, the next 20 years, which is what I'm more interested in, in my new job, is going to be about reinvestment and redevelopment, either small r redevelopment or in some instances, not all big r redevelopment. And that reinvestment is going to be in the existing built environment. And you've heard several speakers uh, talk about the current economic conditions. This basin is currently taking stock. Virtually every jurisdiction is taking stock. And what we're seeing is the population is decreasing. Our schools are closing. Our infrastructure is aging, in some instances deteriorating. And we have a declining economic base. All of that has now been exacerbated by what is a national economic meltdown. And North Lake Tahoe in particular is seeing this played out with its, you know, most recently with this Tahoe Truckee school realignment situation. So TRPA is extremely sensitive and understands the current situation that the local jurisdictions are facing and frankly that TRPA now uh, needs to do its planning in the context of uh, the current economic situation. And by planning and building stronger communities, we will have strong schools again, and we can have strong communities again. On the other hand, if the basin doesn't reposition itself quite well for the future, we are going to suffer. We're going to suffer economically. We're going to suffer environmentally and we are going to suffer socially. TRPA's primary focus needs to be on that environmental piece, but we are not insensitive to, or and we do understand 
the economic and social piece. And I believe that we are at a crossroads in this space, and not only in terms of our evolving economy, but also in terms of the changing demographic makeup of our communities, as well as with restoration of the lake. And to continue to make progress, we cannot rely upon business as usual. And a big part of our future success, of TRPA's future success, and frankly, the Basin's future success, is going to be in partnering with leaders like yourselves. The TMDL science, the total maximum daily load science, it's water quality science, is now telling us that in order to continue toward improved lake clarity, the basin needs another billion and a half dollars of environmental investment over the next 10 years. And in order to leverage that continued investment of federal and state dollars, local jurisdictions like Placer County are going to need to contribute. I know what the, the, the constraints are about local funding right now, but private investment through redevelopment is key to achieving some of that uh, uh, fund, some of that funding, some of that billion and a half dollar funding is going to have to come through redevelopment. If it doesn't come through redevelopment and reinvestment in existing built environment, it's going to have to come from some other government entity. And all eyes are on local jurisdictions. Therefore, in moving forward, we have some important decisions to make collectively as a basin. Uh, and we need to make these not only about how the Tahoe Basin communities are going to look in 20 years, and I want to circle back to uh, Supervisor Euler's question about the, the feasibility of some of our uh, alternative assumptions, some of the assumptions that we're making in the alternatives to the regional plan, because I think I can shed some light. Um, we're going to have to make some decisions about what this basin looks like in 20 years, but we're also going to have to ask hard questions and make very hard decisions about what tools the local jurisdictions are going to use to help support and do your part for the lake. We need the local jurisdiction contribution in order to leverage hundreds of millions of dollars of, of federal and state funding. And that message is being delivered to us very loud and clear at the federal and state level. I'm hopeful because I believe that Placer County promises to be a leader in all of this. I wasn't able to go to your ribbon cutting this morning, but I know that some comments were made about your vision for uh, what Kings Beach uh, can become. And I think that that's a hopeful vision. The Kings Beach commercial core area redesign along with private development, redevelopment projects like the CEP projects are the kind of investment that's going to help the lake. Not only the economic and social fabric of the lake, but those projects have to be designed to help the environmental fabric of the lake as well. And that's what we hope to work with you all to achieve. Um, you've heard from Jennifer about many of these projects in the past, and I'm going to continue to look to her thoughts and ideas as our representative on the TRPA board. Um, for example, there are other ideas on or near the horizon. Some of these ideas are a little bit further out. Some of them are, are closer to the near term, but uh, all of them can potentially be within the realm of the possible. Placer County is an absolutely key transportation artery. With the transit center project that was recently approved by the Tahoe, uh, by, by the TRPA board, as well as things like projects like the marina expansion and other key transportation building blocks, this jurisdiction is going to become a key location for delivering our transportation links in the basin. And I hope to be able to work with you on developing those links. Um, I can also imagine a day, it's a little bit harder to imagine, but I can imagine the day when we connect the basin with Amtrak service to Truckee, and possibly a day when there is train to ferry service moving our visitors around the basin. 
it can happen here, and it can happen with thoughtful planning. I'm going to put the planning back in the name of the agency. It can happen with visionary leadership, and it can happen, most importantly, with cooperation among the different entities of the basin. Um, so long as we make the kinds of proposals that are to scale, that are the type of change that's appropriate to the very sensitive environment in which we live and work and play. And, you know, therein lies the challenge, but because everyone has different ideas about what is appropriate to scale, but I know that those answers are there and I'm committed to working with you on developing them. Um, you know, there are going to be other creative solutions that have to be uh, developed and uh, there may be opportunities where transportation sales tax measures are proposed uh, on, in terms of your countywide budget. I hope that in any of those proposals that come forward you will keep in mind uh, TRPA's uh, expenditure plans uh, to, to help us raise the funds that we need for the environmental gains here in the basin. So uh, TRPA supports and is very thankful for your continued leadership. And I, on behalf of TRPA, am committing to working cooperatively with you as we move forward. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, and I can answer any questions. Um, and if you want me to come back to your question about the alternatives, um, you know, an environmental impact statement is not a plan. An environmental impact statement is nothing more than a, a, a range of alternatives that represents an environmental envelope, a set of environmental envelopes. And so what we have tried to do is to craft our alternatives in a way that uh, looks at the full range. So we needed an alternative that assumed that 100% of the residences in this basin were occupied by full-time owners. How we accomplish that is a very difficult question. We accomplish that, I think, as you say, by building strong local economies and, um, you know, revitalizing our local communities. But what that mix of uses uh, looks like to support that strong residential base, that is the policy decision to be made in our regional plan. That is, that's the challenge I'm going to put to Jennifer and the other 14 members of the board to say what is the basin's vision for what our communities will look like? Is it going to be 100% live, work communities? And if so, what kind, of, what kind of economic drivers could possibly exist to drive that? Will it be 100% transient tourist so that virtually no one lives in the basin? Probably not. It's probably going to be some hybrid, but we have to ask the hard questions about what kind of land use mix uh, can we um, uh, attract to the basin that, that that is still environmentally sensitive, sensitive enough not to destroy the environment that we live in. <laughs> you know, that, that's what makes planning at Tahoe so interesting. But that's going to be the challenge. So I'm, I'm happy to take other questions. Just a, perhaps a, a follow-up to that. Um, you know, in the conversations that I have with, with business folks here on, on our side of the lake, um, I don't hear anybody thinking that we're going to be achieving 100% of, uh, of, of occupied dwellings um, or even close. Uh, I, I think what they're focusing on is how do we, how do we create a, a viable economic infrastructure that is year-round, um, doesn't thrive in the summer and <coughs> a couple months in the winter. And um, I, I appreciate your statement that that is a, a policy-related decision. I agree <coughs> with you that's a policy-related decision. Um, but also along those lines of, of policy-related decisions um, and where perhaps <coughs> it translates uh, from policy into implementation uh, where the policymakers then rely upon staff for implementation. You've identified nearly a billion and a half dollars that will be needed for additional investment in the basin in order to continue to improve the water quality. Um, 
absent something falling out of Washington, D.C., um, <clears throat> I, I think you've correctly identified that that's going to have to come from investment in, in the area, because as you identified, we're almost at build out. That's going to have to come from investment area in the area in the area of redevelopment. But for folks to come forward with significant redevelopment projects that will provide for the kinds of improvements to water quality that we'd all like to see, folks need to be able to begin that process, I think, with a little bit more certainty of the outcome than they currently have when they engage that process. We've got some significant dollars being proposed for investment in Placer County in the basin. And a lot of big question marks over the heads of those people that are prepared. And I, I think you will see investment dollars in this area that will yield better water, water quality, better air quality, if they know they're entering a process that has A, a level playing field, and B, an organization, an entity, a staff with an open mind that doesn't necessarily look at development as a bad thing, but maybe as a tool to achieve exactly what you said that we're going to need to rely on redevelopment to achieve. I couldn't, I'm not sure this is on. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we, <laughs> the most important thing that can happen at this point is that we can start to coalesce around the concepts of TRPA's regional plan. The reason that we are four years into our regional planning is that the basin has a tendency to become fairly balkanized in its views. Really? I hadn't noticed that about Tahoe. <laughs> my, great, my greatest challenge is to try to move this planning process forward and to find that common ground and to bring people together um, around that common ground. And believe me, I find it an extremely daunting challenge, but I understand what you're saying about the need for certainty when you're making, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of investment. Um, so I would recommend to you um, a statement that I delivered to our governing board uh, in support of my appointment. I have some daunting goals ahead of me, one of which is to build the strengths of our staff. Uh, and that is something that I will work on. It will take some time. Uh, and I, I hope to be successful in that. But uh, uh, I would encourage you to read that statement. It'll tell you a little bit about what I'm about and what my goals are. Uh, but I understand the point you're making. Uh, whether we can get there is going to require that uh, you work with me. Thank you. Yes. Jennifer. Um, yes, Joanne, thank you for showing up today. I really appreciate you coming all the way up here to the, you know, off the lake to meet with us. Um, I, I did want to um, have you clarify, possibly for me and certainly for the rest of the board, in, in terms of the alternatives that were presented to us, my understanding as still the new kid on the governing board is that we aren't necessarily going to have to adopt alternative two, that this is going to be sort of a cafeteria style process for the governing board and the TRPA staff to identify which pieces within those different alternatives we want to pull together to become the new plan. Am I, am I correct in thinking yeah, that? Yes. Yes, you are correct in that. Um, and the plan alternative, uh, the EIS alternatives, as I, as I stated earlier, really reflect a range. Alternative two is kind of an in-between alternative. Alternative three is the bigger, badder, you know, development alternative. Alternative four was intended to address a set of comments that we had received from the conservation community. And so it's, it, you know, what we're trying to do is to bound um, uh, the choices here. Uh, in the end, it is a cafeteria style, but it's a cafeteria, uh, cafeteria style that is going to need to be grounded in uh, the environmental findings that we need to make. So, uh, you know, we can't jettison 
all, all hard decisions uh, in that cafeteria selection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my second question, um, because it's so important to this board and so important to Placer County, when do you think the Kings Beach Commercial Corps Improvement Project will be coming back in front of the governing board? Uh, I am anticipating this sometime this summer, and, and we've been in pretty constant communication with your staff about that. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're following their lead a little bit about on, on timing. Great. Thank you so much. Tim? Thank you. Appreciate your comments and, and taking the time to come here and talk to us. Happy to. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Now we have item East West Partners. Michael Johnson. Mr. Chair, Michael Johnson with the Planning Department. On behalf of county staff, I would like to welcome you here to North Star. Uh, this is a very exciting time not only for the county, but for the uh, owners up here at North Star. You're experiencing and you're uh, seeing an area in transition. North Star itself has been around for 30 plus years, uh, but it's only within the last five years or so that we've seen a lot of, thank you, a lot of change here in the area. Uh, we have three different hosts uh, who are here with us today. Jeff Stevens with the North Star Property Owners Association. Uh, the, they are the original homeowners of this area. And, and when you think of North Star, you think of one entity. But there are really many entities that make up North Star. Booth Creek uh, Property Holdings are the operators of the um, resort itself. And John Loomis from Booth Creek is here to speak with you today. And East West Partners uh, is the real residential uh, development organization that has been developing the new properties up here. And they are the developers of the village here uh, that we are uh, sitting in right now. And so at this time, I would like to introduce Jim Telling. He's a partner with East West Partners. And he wants to give you a brief overview of where they've been and where they're going. Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me today. I'll get you back on schedule here in a minute or two, so I won't take much of your time. Um, before I start the presentation, uh, I know we're going to tour the, the Ritz-Carlton afterwards if we have time, so can answer a lot of the detailed questions when we're in the hotel at that point in time. Be happy to answer any broad overviews here. Um, let me just start out with the Ritz-Carlton, uh, give you a quick overview. It's uh, 170 guest rooms. There's 23 private residences, for sale residences uh, um, in the building also. There's going to be a um, 20,000 square foot spa and fitness center that will open as part of the hotel. Uh, banquet meeting space will total 12,000 square feet, so quite a large, um, large uh, meeting environment will be able to service some pretty large groups. Uh, within the hotel itself, we're going to have about 170 room, 170 seat restaurant, and uh, we've we've reached an agreement with uh, a chef, uh, Tracy Desjardins, from uh, Jardinier down in San Francisco, and she's going to be um, acting on a consulting basis with us to uh, come up with the menu, come up with kind of the decor, the the staffing. So it should be a really exciting addition to uh, to restaurants here in North Star. Um, we're going to have uh, a lobby bar, really wonderful lobby, which you'll see today, uh, and then a gourmet deli. Uh, all of these are obviously available for hotel guests and the uh, public to come in and utilize also. Um, when the hotel opens, we anticipate somewhere between 300 and 350 employees, uh, so a, a good employment addition to, um, to uh, North Star. And uh, also as part of the hotel, we're going to be finishing a gondola this summer that will provide a pedestrian connection between the Ritz-Carlton and North Star Village. So again, we're not duplicating uh, any of the village functions up on the mountain. We, fe we feel that uh, to make the village successful, this is where all the action should take place. So our guests will be able to ride the gondola down in the evening, come down to dinner, ice skate, um, guests in the village can go up and have dinner in the restaurant also. So that will open concurrently with the hotel. 
Uh, we're planning our opening here uh, in early winter of 2009. Uh, we're on track for that. There's also a Ritz-Carlton Club that's adjacent to the hotel, which offers a fractional pr product for sale that will open concurrently with the hotel. And their first phase is 28 out of a total of 78 units. Uh, we do have some future private residences as part of the Ritz campus, and we'll, um, we'll get into those as, as uh, economic conditions warrant. Just a couple quick pictures. This was um, midwinter when we had some great snow, as you can see. Um, be a lot, lot more progress that you'll see today than where we were here, but uh, that's actually the uh, main entrance to the hotel there in the center. This is a finished residence, which we'll be able to take a, a look into today. So this is one of the private residences that um, is finished, furnished, and you'll get a sense of how that, uh, how that looks. And this is a picture actually from the ski mountain looking down onto the Ritz. So you can see it's going to be a great, great location for, uh, for everybody, great ski in, ski out. Um, that whole back side of the hotel is basically one big outdoor deck. So be available for outdoor dining, sitting around a fire pit. Uh, the deli is there, so if you want to grab a quick sandwich, it's a place to go. So I think it should be a really, uh, really neat place to, um, to congregate. This is one of the guest rooms, which we'll um, look at today when we're in the hotel. Uh, we had uh, more than a few um, visits from the Ritz-Carlton finalizing this guest room. It's amazing what they focus on, but I learned, I learned quickly. So uh, anyway, really nice looking guest room. I think the, the feel is a little more contemporary, but still mountainy, but um, not over the top. And there's a picture of the uh, backyard of the Ritz here in the wintertime. You can see the top of North Star uh, Ski Mountain in the background. Some of the other communities we've developed here in, uh, in North Star uh, the village, which you, you, you see today, uh, we've, we've completed six new residential buildings with a little over 200 residences. They range from one to four bedroom units. Um, we're about 92% sold out of all those units, so we have uh, 18 left to sell, and uh, hopefully we'll get through those here in uh, very short term. Uh, the commercial retail area, there's a little over 150,000 square feet of of commercial space here in the village. The village was actually very, very vibrant this, this winter. I don't know if anybody's up here and spent any time, but with the ice rink and uh, the shops, it was really, really a good place to hang out. A lot of families were out on that ice rink. Uh, there's 22 retail tenants and 10 restaurants here in the village. And uh, that's 98% uh, leased out. We just finished another project here in the village called North Star Lodge. It's a Hyatt fractional project. Uh, we opened that in December of this year, the first phase. It's two and three bedroom residences, and there's a total of 34 uh, units. And there's also a very nice uh, fitness and pool facility that we built for all the owners here in the village to utilize both winter and summer. Uh, we did a little, little townhome project, Village Walk Townhomes. Uh, first phase was 12 units. Uh, which we completed here um, again last fall. We've got 50% of those sold out. You can walk to the village from, uh, from Village Walk, and uh, we'll build the remaining two phases over time. That's just below North Star Lodge, so it's on your way up. Just past Big Springs Drive, right across the, right across the street. Right. And then we had our first uh, community up in uh, North Star Highlands this winter, a uh, little townhome project called Trailside, 16 units. Um, we've got 12 of the 16 that the folks are closed and they're in. The other folks, four units will close here uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, but it's actually the first residential community within North Star. So we actually had owners living up in, in North Star last year. Finally, uh, Sawmill Heights is our employee housing project that is right down at the entrance to North Star. Um, there's 96 total units there. Uh, with a little over 250 bedrooms, and it's an affordable product. Here's a picture of the ice rink. Um, really, actually, it looks a lot more vibrant than this right now because there's cabanas around it, and it's really, like I said, a pretty good place to hang out on a Friday afternoon and watch people. They really enjoy themselves. 
uh, one of the pictures of one of the retailers. You can get a glass of wine while you're shopping for ski clothes. Um, this is the far end of the village over by the gondola, looking back down into the village core so you get a sense of, um, of what it looks like. This is North Star Lodge, which just finished here in December. Um, very, very nice project. There's the inside of one of the units, uh, the living room. So you can see, um, uh, you know, very, very nice level of finishes. Some fire pits. There's a lot of fire pits around the village. We have a lot of those around, and people love to hang out around them, not only at North Star Lodge, but also within the village, and great, great gathering point for folks. This is the new um, swim and fitness center that finished and was open for this winter for uh, our property owners up here. This is a picture of Village Walk that's um, just past Big Springs Drive on your way up and uh, an interior of one of, those, one of those residences. This is Trailside, which is up, up in Highlands. It's actually right adjacent to the Ritz. We'll, we'll be able to see a bit of it when we drive by it today uh, on our way to the hotel and an interior of uh, one of the trailside homes. Sawmill Heights, this was our ribbon cutting a couple years ago. Um, very, very nice facility. Again, 96 total units. And then I just want to touch on a couple of the other amenities, even though they're not in Placer County. I hesitated whether to add these or not, but it's part of the, the pizzazz of what, we, um, what we're offering to people. Uh, as one of the property owners here, you get to join the Tahoe Mountain Club where you get access to three golf courses. There's three separate restaurants. There's one on the lake, um, one here in the village, and one up on, on the top of North Star. That, that one operates in the winter. The one on the lake operates in the summer. So it, it's, a, it's a way to get a, a tie to the lake from North Star. Um, then two of our golfing communities, Old Greenwood and Gray's Crossing, you can see is a mix of uh, single-family homes and some villas. Um, so those are very, very nice communities that are essentially complete and just awaiting more homes. Here's a view of Schaefer's Camp, which is at the top of North Star Ski Mountain. That's the inside of Schaefer's. It's a great place to dine. You can actually look out the back window and look over to Squaw, so it's really a fabulous, fabulous view. This is the Alpine Club, which is uh, here in the village, mostly utilized for owners for um, apres ski and a place to store their skis when they're um, um, coming from Old Greenwood or Gray's Crossing. So it's it's a it's a very nice uh, very nice amenity for them. This is the uh, Wild Goose Two, which is um, a boat that we have over for our property owners at the Wild Goose Restaurant on the lake. So it's available for um, certain special events. It goes out once or twice a month for uh, the owners and takes them around the lake. There's a picture of the wild goose. And then finally the pavilion at Old Greenwood, which is a great uh, family gathering point. Again, big, big pool, um, huge outdoor deck, so it's very, very crowded in the summertime. And then a couple of shots of the golf courses here. Um, before I introduce John Loomis from Booth Creek, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the mountain improvement plan and what Booth Creek has going forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have, or also we can uh, certainly talk more when we tour the Ritz here and, uh, in a little bit later this afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to North Star. It's nice to have you up here. Um, I wanted to touch today just very briefly on uh, what we've got planned for this summer and then a little bit of what we've got planned in the future and, and why we're doing that. But if you look on this map, the, uh, the yellow lifts there, and if I can step over here for just a minute, we're down here in the village right here. Will it do that? I feel like I'm on stage here. But um, anyway, so we're down here in the village, and uh, over at the, at the Hyatt right here is the base of the gondola 
that will go up here. And this is going in this summer. The foundations are in already and, and we'll complete that project this summer. Then additionally up at the Mid Mountain, out the back of, of some of Jim's pictures with the, uh, with the Ritz, will be the replacement of our last original riblet chairlift here, a very sad occasion for us to, to see that go, um, with a, uh, a bigger lift and some expanded uh, um, grooming out there, summer grooming to, to help with the teaching and, and, and really double the, the uh, extent of our teaching area. It's, it's a, become a very big part of what we do here and, and a very important part of what we do here. So. Um, those are uh, what we're looking at for this summer. Then additionally, uh, I believe this has already been improved, uh, a second lift out of the backside, which um, hopefully will come in the, in the next year or two. It's just having that one lift out of there that turned my hair gray. Um, and uh, as, as we go forward, What's driving a lot of this is, uh, you know, we're in a very competitive market here, certainly locally and regionally, and additionally with this uh, wonderful bed base and, and commercial core that we've developed here, I think we can compete nationally and, and bring uh, destination skiers here. So um, in order to match what, what's happened down here, we've done a lot of work on the mountain up to this point and, and uh, plan on on doing some more there. So just a couple of things to, to touch on. If you see the ski runs there that have the uh, dark brown around them, um, that is additional widening that uh, we'll be doing in the future. It's interesting as, uh, as the sport changes with the, the equipment and, and the snowboarding, uh, the ability to carve longer, wider turns. All of a sudden trails that, that were developed in the 70s now are, are kind of narrow and, and really to get the maximum enjoyment out of the mountain you look to to kind of widen the trails where you can. Um, additionally the uh, the improvements on the mountain hopefully will will get people to uh, stay here longer um, with with more to do and all of that so that's really the completion of what I had to say unless you've got any questions and uh, yeah, I have a, a question. What is identified in, in the red as J? Down there at the bottom. The one, yeah, going from the village up to, looks like Lookout Mountain, about where the little rope toe gets yep. off right now? Yep. That, that would be a, uh, a lift that would leave from the village here and go to the top of Lookout Mountain. That's proposed for when? Uh, good question. I would say that that is probably three or four lifts away. Okay. So five years, maybe longer. And then you just tie back down to that through home run right now somehow? Uh, yes, that... you, you would eventually, to get back down to the village, you'd come down home run there. Okay. Um, I, I hadn't skied North Star in a long time. I, I spent 10 years over at Squaw Valley Coaching over there. And uh, when I got on Lookout Mountain and some of the train you have back there, and I happened to hit it, on that one weekend in February where uh, I believe it was a Sunday night, about 18 inches dropped over in the back there. There's some of the best tree skiing I've ever had anywhere in North America right there with the right conditions. It was unbelievable, the fun I had back in there. Well, thank you very much. Your timing was impeccable. It was. Um, yeah, that was something that we uh, finished that last year. We extended that lift down into Marta's camp and uh, did over 50 acres of, of thinning out there for the, for the tree skiing, which is a real plus for us for the skiing side of things. Additionally, it's a win-win uh, as far as fuels management goes right. out there too. Right. And um, I think I think you probably have the best tree skiing now in the entire Tahoe area. Thank I mean, you. I, there's you nothing like a, a squad. There's nothing squad that compares to that. <laughs> I mean, I, and that always historically was kind of the knock on North Star was the the terrain you had. Years ago, you had Pluto's Plunge, and that was it. Absolutely. And, and now you've, you've opened up some incredible terrain, but that tree skiing over there was just unbelievable. Well, good, and I hope you get a chance to enjoy it more in a, in a bigger year, but we're really looking forward to that. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
I guess that's it for today. Then we will adjourn until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Take, take a bus ride to see the room.